11th Sunday after Pentecost worship service. Today we will be zeroing in on one word, trust. It's a simple word, but hard to put into practice. It's easy to place our trust in so many different places and people and forget to place it in our God. So today, we will remind you why God is the only one we need to trust for all things. Let us begin our worship service for one and only Savior. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please join us in singing the hymn, I am trusting in you, Lord Jesus. The words are printed on the screen. lesson of the morning comes from Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 through 9. This will also serve as a portion of God's word for our sermon this morning. They set out from Mount Tor along the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became very impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Why have you brought us out, to, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water, and we are disgusted by this worthless food. The Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and the snakes bit the people. As a result, many people from Israel died. The people went to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a venomous snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on the pole. If a snake had bitten anyone, if that person looked at the bronze snake, he lived. The Psalm of the Day. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot stumble. He who watches over you will not slumber. Yes, he who watches over Israel will not slumber. He will not sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will watch to keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your going and your coming from now to eternity. The second lesson comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. In this lesson, Paul highlights the very foundation of our trust in God, his love for us in Christ. It is a love that cannot be taken away from us. Not even death can take it away. Let us put our trust in God in all things. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all along. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The verse of the day comes from Matthew 6, 31 through 32. Alleluia! So do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the unbelievers chase after all these things. Certainly your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Alleluia! The Gospel lesson from today comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Jesus gives us a perfect example of why we can trust in him in earthly matters and in eternal matters. He shows that he can provide for our earthly needs, but he also demonstrates his great love for us by showing his deep compassion for people. Jesus has indeed won our trust. Let us trust in him in all things. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there, from there in a boat to a deserted place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus got out of the boat, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. When evening came, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. They told him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. Bring them here to me, he replied. Then he instructed the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish. After looking up to heaven, he blessed them. 
He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave the food to the people. They all ate and were filled. They picked up 12 basketfuls of what was left over from the broken pieces. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not even counting women and children. Our hymn of the day comes or is hymn 441, verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. The words will be on the screen. Volunteers. 
But nonetheless, the grumbling was there, and there was a lot of it. For many of us, perhaps, grumbling is one of the first things that come to mind when we think of the Israelites. It's recorded throughout the pages of the Old Testament time and time again. One of pastor's professors in college once gave a chapel devotion dealing with the grumbling Israelites. And he asked the class if they could make a grumbling noise every time the word appeared in his reading. And there were many, many moaning noises echoing throughout the chapel that morning. In our lesson for today, the grumbling of the Israelites was a result of them just being fed up with the wandering. They missed home. They were tired of not having much food or water. And they absolutely hated the food and the water that they had. And this complaining wasn't just to one another. They went to Moses with their complaints. They wanted him to do something to fix this mess that they were in. But what they didn't realize or think about was that their complaints weren't really directed at Moses, but at God. It was God who gave Moses the instructions to bring the people out of Egypt and to lead the people. They were complaining to God. Wow. Wow. When you think about it, what arrogance and complete defiance. How could they do that? How could they even think about doing such a thing? They completely forgot. They abandoned all their memories of the things that God had done for them. Just look at their long list of complaints. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? They missed home? Are you kidding? In Egypt? They, had they already forgotten what life in Egypt was like? They were slaves in Egypt. They were abused, mistreated, overworked. Not a great life at all, but God brought them out of that miserable place. He saved them by His grace. There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food, they said. Have they already let the miracle of God providing water from a rock in the middle of the desert slip their minds? Have they already forgot that God miraculously provided manna and quail when they were in need of food? Why? Why couldn't they see it? They never seemed to understand. It just doesn't appear that it even crossed their minds that God had been with them, providing His food and His water, safety and whatever else they needed. He even appeared as a pillar of cloud by, by uh, day and a pillar of fire by night to lead them on their journey. What more could they have asked for? Now, believe it or not, I know someone just like those Israelites. He just never seems to be satisfied. He's always grumbling about something, never content. He complains about the job he has, even though he would say he has a pretty good job, it usually isn't too challenging for him to find something he doesn't like about it. He doesn't like the workload, the pay, the co-workers. He complains about his family. He seems to think that he does, he does way more work than his wife does. He says his children can oftentimes be a nuisance. And at times, he says he feels just tied down because of his family. He complains about his house, his car, the weather, traffic, how the government is carrying out certain things, new things in church 
that the church is doing, you name it, he has complained about it. Yes, actually I know someone just like this. I know him quite well. It's me. And it's you too. So often we find something we don't like and we complain. And what we often don't realize or think about is that these complaints aren't just to different people, but they're to God. We are complaining to God. Wow, what arrogance and what complete defiance. How could we do this? How could we even think about doing such a thing? We forget. We abandon all our memories, all the things that God has done for us. He has showered us with blessings day after day. And what do we give back? Look at our complaints. I will lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Your Heavenly Father has provided all you need in your life here on earth. Food, water, shelter, it's all there in abundance. And your Heavenly Father doesn't stop there. He, constant, he is constantly showering us with blessings. He gives us jobs so that we can provide for ourselves and our families. He gives us people to serve in our government to help keep us to help keep peace here on earth. He places loved ones in our lives to bring us love, companionship, and joy. He gives us the means to come before him and worship in a beautiful building surrounded by people who confess the same faith and that care for us. Yes, God takes care of us and blesses us. He does so far more than we need or could possibly ever deserve. But the incredible thing is, is that His love for us doesn't stop there. When God heard the complaints of the Israelites, He had had it. He was done. He didn't want to hear those ungrateful cries any longer. So, as we learned in our first lesson, He sent he sent snakes. Now, we don't know how many, but we do know that this. These snakes were vicious and they were dangerous. Their venom was lethal. The people were in serious danger and many, unfortunately, ended up dying. So it didn't take very long for them to put two and two together. They knew why the snakes were there. They knew that it was because of their own sin. Their sins of defiance, rebellion, and anger toward their God. They pleaded to Moses to go and pray to God to take them away. Then out of pure love, nothing less than pure love, God gave his solution. Moses made a bronze snake and fastened it onto a pole so that anyone who would look at it would not die from the, from the deadly venom, but live. This world has its share of venomous snakes as well. Perhaps one of the more well-known species of venomous snakes is the African black mamba. It is feared by many, and for good reason. The venom in one bite from this snake is lethal enough to kill a human being in just 30 short minutes. But as deadly as this snake is, it comes nowhere close to being as deadly as the snakes you and I live with and are attacked by each and every day. Like the Israelites, we too have venomous snakes all around us, and they are there because of our sin. These snakes come in all different shapes and sizes. When you attend a, a funeral or even just drive by a cemetery, you see a very real and a very powerful result of sin, death. When you feel the physical pain of a pulled muscle 
or feel the emotional pain of losing someone close to you, you experience the result of sin. You see it when the demands and busyness of school or work seems to be piling up and your stress continues to rise higher and higher. You see it and I see it by simply looking at ourselves. All our weaknesses and inadequacies stack up and they tell us that we come nowhere near to God's standard of absolute perfection. And they tell us that there is no one who is, there is, there is only one thing that we deserve, and that's eternal damnation in hell. What can we do about all of these venomous snakes in our lives? Don't just dig down deep. Don't simply power through it. Don't tell yourself the common lie the world likes to tell, that you can do it all on your own, because you simply cannot. Instead, Remember where your help comes from. Lift your eyes to the mountains, to Calvary's mountain. Lift your eyes to see your Savior fastened on a cross. Just as Moses lifted that bronze snake on the cross in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. See your one and only source of life eternal. It is there where you will find restoration and healing from the wounds caused by sin. It is there where you will find assurance that your sins have been paid for and taken away completely. It is there that you will find peace peace that the world simply cannot give. Lift your eyes to the cross. Once you've lifted your eyes to the cross, proclaim the cross. Tell everyone about Christ and Him crucified. Tell the world about what their Savior has done for them. Show them where they can find healing, restoration, assurance, peace, and life eternal. Yes, point their eyes to their source of trustworthy help for both now and eternity. Show them Jesus. Amen. We will now sing, My God Will Never Leave Me, verses 1 and 4. Four.
Thus confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of the church. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Jesus Christ be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society, thus our national state and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Now we have a special prayer for Adam Dorshak. Um, he will be going under, doing, going, undergoing some testing. So with that, let us pray. O oh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved little children and took them in his arms, hear our prayer. In your infinite goodness, look down on Adam, your dear child. Work in this place and in this child's body with a healing power which comes from your creative will. Cause us to have greater faith and trust in you. Bless all that is being done to bring restoration of health. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear us as we bring our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear our prayer, and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will close with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace.
We will close with a closing hymn, Go My Children with My Blessing, hymn 332.